I don't know about you, but I am a huge fan of Saturday mornings. Uh, on the count of three, on 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 the count of three, I want you to yell out the cartoon that you remember about Saturday mornings the most. We're gonna date yourself right now. Ready? One, two, three. Was there a consensus in the room on what cartoon we, we like to watch? I realized my, my days as a youth pastor were over when I would start using analogies that the young kids had no idea what I was talking about. So um, like it, to bring it to, to full circle, if you just shouted, shouted out Gumby, you would have already lost the last generation. <laughs> I, remember, I remember telling stories um, of, of my, I'm going to date myself here, and if, if, if we're in the same age group, you're going to nod your head. Um, you're waiting for it right now, aren't you? Um, how many remember the show Saved by the Bell? All right, I'm in good company. What about Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? I technically was not allowed to watch that, but sometimes I would sit back and watch it, and my parents would come in and turn the TV off, and uh, my dad was notorious of buying a new TV and throwing it away because it was garbage. And then he would go buy a new TV and then he would get mad again and he would then throw that TV away. I think it was his great excuse of just buying the new latest and greatest TV. I think that's what was going on. But Saturday mornings have really taken a special place in, uh, in our hearts because of, of this one horrible thing that my wife told me. She told me this one time. She says, you know, Jay, we only have 17 summers with our kids while they're in the house. And the way that she worded that, it put something in my heart to go, the, the few moments that we have in this season of raising our children are to be really special. Um, those equate to, to Saturdays because we only have so many. I've got an um, 11 year old that's gonna turn 12 years old in a couple days. Happy birthday to Jace, you're awesome. and looking pretty good today. He's vibrant, he's full of life. Um, but Saturdays, I don't know what, what, what makes Saturdays so special in our homes, but I, I'm thinking because the work week is over, there's something about being intentional about spending time with family. Uh, there's something about uh, the, the whole family coming together and doing something that benefits each and every one and the vantage point. It's a connection point. We often talk in the church about what happened on Friday. We often talk about in the church what happened on Resurrection Sunday. This morning, I just want to devote a few moments on what I believe happened on Saturday. Saturday, there's not a whole lot of, of mentioning in Scripture of what happened between the miracle or the sacrifice that happened on the cross. We know that the veil was torn in two, and between the veil being torn in two and the tomb being rolled open, what exactly happened? We've been doing a study in 1 Peter, and I'm going to borrow a verse in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 20, that gives us a hint on what was happening on what many have referenced Holy Saturday. I was doing some research the last couple weeks and, and studying some early church fathers like St. Augustine and some, some others it has perplexed many a theologian or many a scholar or many a church, early church father, and I am not going to attempt to try to answer what was happening on that Saturday, but to give you a clue on what did happen. We might not know exactly what happened, but we know what did happen. I believe the reason why this is so important to, to talk about on Easter Sunday is because I believe many in their Christian walk are stuck in the Saturday of their Christian walk. They are thankful for Jesus as Savior, but they have yet, have yet to realize the victory that you can have in Christ on Sunday because you don't know the authority that was given to you on Saturday. You mind if I preach a little bit this morning on, on, on Easter Sunday? Many believers are stuck in Saturday. They're stuck in Saturday living in this comatose, complacent, compromising state because they do not know what Jesus did on that Saturday. Let me give you an example, a mystery, so to speak, that Peter gave us as he hinted about what was happening on that Saturday. Here's what he says. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, 
that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. That's what happened on Friday. 19, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. There is this cryptic response in Peter that basically tells not what Jesus was doing on Saturday, but the result of what he did on that Saturday. You ready for it? The authorities and strongholds that were struggled to put under his feet were once and for all put under his feet so that we could have victory. The Bible puts it this way, that he conquered death, hell, and the grave. That he went down, the picture that we get as preachers is that he went down and he wasn't just sleeping or merely resting, but he went down to death and Hades, Hades is another word for hell, and he conquered the things that had yet to be conquered so that you and I could have a victorious living life. In other words, he broke the cycles that people would live in so that we wouldn't have to live a life full of cycles, but a life full of victory. Isn't that amazing how many in the American church can describe their walk with Jesus as cycles? That one day you're victorious, only hoping on to hold on to what Jesus did, and you hold on with all of your might, with, with you know, white knuckle grips and saying, Lord, I never want to let go of you, Lord, I never want to let go of you, Lord, if you get me out of this, I'll never do it again, Lord, if you let me get, get out of this, I'll never do it again. Many of us have prayed those types of prayers only to, in our own authority and in our own flesh, fall and do the things that we said we would never do again. That is the, that is the, the 90% of American Christians live in this cycle of victory to defeat, victory into defeat, and it leaves them discouraged and disappointed. And I want to tell you, I want to give you the picture of what happened on Saturday. What happened on Saturday is that we had to stop trying to hold on to God and now we are, we are as people in God's hand and now he is holding on to us. We don't have to live as though we are trying to attain freedom. We live from a place of freedom. And that is the beautiful thing that you have to know as a believer of Jesus is that you don't have to hope to one day walk in freedom or walk to a place of freedom you are have the ability now to walk in the authority that Jesus has given you to now walk in a place of freedom and victory. So what does that practically, tangibly mean here this morning as I, as I give you this, this, this Easter devotional? The things that you have been cyclical in your life struggling with, I believe by the power of Jesus and his blood and what he did on that Saturday, you do not have to submit to those things anymore but now you can live a life full of freedom, love, and joy, and peace because of what Jesus did. If you're thankful for that, give the Lord a big round of applause. <laughs> thankful. I am thankful that we do not, as believers, have to be stuck in a Saturday kind of living anymore. So, Pastor, how do I stop being stuck in Saturday? I believe that when Jesus comes into our lives, he transforms our hearts and then this born-again experience gives us a new perspective to live life under. One of the reasons why I was so encouraged yesterday as your pastor, we had um, literally have been seeing God do some incredible things in our church over the last several months. We've had people get delivered of drug addictions that they've been under for close to 20 years. I'm thankful for the one-step program that's found in Jesus. <laughs> thankful. I'm thankful that he delivers. I'm thankful that he sets free. I'm thankful that I'm thankful that there is programs out there for sure that teach us new ways to walk our new belief in Christian life out. But I'm thankful that one, one drop of blood is enough. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for that, that freedom from addiction and struggles and mess, the places we find ourselves. And I'm thankful that we live from a place of freedom, not trying to attain freedom. I'm thankful for that. I'm also so grateful that as I was watching so many people serve at Rise 24 I noticed the new Christians or the new believers doing things that they were never told or taught to do and discipled in, but the Holy Spirit in them was teaching them how to serve, even though they were never told how to serve. 
Uh, we had a recent testimony of a wonderful family that God is literally re restoring their marriage and, and breaking years of drug addiction off. I watched him grab trash bags without even being asked and walking through our parking lot and picking up trash because we know that everything that God saves serves. We know that. We know that everything that God saves serves and we know that everything that God saves gives. There's a, there's a spirit of generosity behind that. I am thankful that the power of God that resides in people and believers doesn't leave them where, they, where God found them, but the sanctifying work in them almost from the start changes their perspective so that you don't have to get stuck in Saturday living anymore and you can graduate to Sunday victorious living because why? The tomb is empty. It is empty and now we have a victory that we can have in Jesus Christ. If you're thankful for that, give the Lord a big round of applause. We're thankful. I'm thankful that we have the spirit inside of us the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now lives in you and I, and we get to be able to walk through this victorious, powerful Christian walk that allows us not only to be free, but gives us the authority to set other people free. It's what being part of the, the church is, and I'm not just talking about being part of Parkway, this local body. I'm talking about the part that we play in the larger body of Christ in our community and in our world. For far too long, there are too many people that live in this cyclical life of a Christian walk, so-called Christian walk, where they go from victory to struggle, victory to struggle, never actually seeing the ability to actually walk this thing out in victory. Because the truth is this, people that walk in cycles will produce people that walk in cycles. People that are, are bound will constantly be around people that are bound. It is only free people that can actually set people free. And this Easter Sunday morning, what I wanted to challenge every one of our church members, every one of our church attenders, is for you to know the authority that you have is not just a power-filled moment on a Friday, but the Lord on Saturday, He was doing work on our behalf to give us keys to the kingdom, and those keys to the kingdom allow us to walk in an authority that allow us to walk this thing out, not just to set us free, but to begin to change our family's life and those around us in our community, because why? People that are free set people that are bound. If you want to be part of that kind of church, again, give the Lord a big round of applause in this place. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. So, so pastor, tangibly, how does this begin to happen in someone's life? Um, many times the church, especially the Pentecostal Spirit-filled church, will, will point to a, a moment, a tangible moment, when the Holy Spirit begins to talk to people and, and touch them with the presence, tangible presence of God. And yes, that's it. That's part of it. It's, it's part of the expression. The Bible talks about we are changed from glory to glory. I've always taught, as I've discipled people, the most important touch from God that you're ever going to get is the next one. What a beautiful thing that is. Look to your neighbor and say, you need the next one. I know you. You need the next one. I heard how you were talking to me on the way here. You need the next touch from God. That the Lord in this progressive sanctification working this thing out he allows us those that are walking with limps to begin to walk a little bit straight in our character and he allows us to begin as we walk to begin to run and as we begin to run we begin to provide the path by which other people around us see I love the way that my dad would share his testimony to many of our family members and friends here's what his spiel was my dad would go to them um, and he would say you remember me before Jesus right and all of his family members would say, yeah, you were jacked up. <laughs> and then he goes, look at me now. You're, you see what God's done in my life now. Like that guy should never have what I have because of what Jesus did in my life. That is the power of Jesus is that you don't have to have a theological background or you don't have to know scripture necessarily in Greek and Hebrew, but we should study to show ourselves a proof. But the power of the gospel is that it is evidence in change lives and hearts that he will take you from the, the Friday of, of, of literally mourning with Christ and what he's done for not just the world's decisions, but for my decisions, and allows us to walk through the Saturday of our existence to where cycles of bondage and trauma and hurt, how they have degraded our families and our lives, that Saturday living does not have to be the final chapter of our story, but we can begin to walk this out in Sunday victorious living so that the world will know that Jesus Christ is indeed risen 
because of what people see in you and I's life. You are the representation. You are the testimony. You are, you are the evidence that Jesus Christ is not living in a tomb. That tomb was rolled away because of the difference that Jesus has made in you and I's life. I am thankful that Jesus took my family from the muck and the mire and he put us on a solid foundation. And when I fall down, he gives me the grace to be able to get back up. And when I see a brother or sister fall, I'm thankful that the thing inside of me doesn't want to point and laugh, but the thing inside of me wants to go and say, it's okay, you're going to make it. All you got to do is just get back up and I'm not going to give you a hand up. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do what someone did for me and I'm going to tell you that we could just stand up in the grace and favor of Jesus Christ because what he's done for one, he can do for all. And if he's done it once, he can do it for you. He can do it for everybody. Come on, somebody. If you love him this morning, give him a big round of applause. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's the kind of church that we're called to be. The kind of church that we're called to be is not in a, in a stuck in a Saturday kind of mindset. And I believe what God is wanting to do in our congregation, through our ministry, through the things that God's doing in our season, is to prove that we don't serve a, a, a dead God, but we serve a God who's alive and well and doing and, and being part of, of life transformations. When I, think about, um, when I think about the whole center and the sacrifice of, of, of that wonderful man, I look at his plaque, and it's, an, it's to be an oasis for young people to come find hope. And watching 50 to 75 brand new young people jump on our, young, uh, on our campus yesterday, I say praise God that we don't serve a dead God, but we serve a God who's still working and doing miracles in young people in our community. <laughs> Thankful for it. When I, when I hear of our, our tradition senior ministry, raise, literally raising funds to be able to bless families that are struggling with the the problems of their day, and meeting a tangible need so they can get to the spiritual issue, I'm thankful that we serve a God that's still alive and doing work today. I am thankful. This Easter message is for those of you that feel like you are stuck in the middle of your mess. This is what the Holy Spirit wanted me to tell you as your pastor this morning. You do not have to be stuck anymore. There is a will and a way of God that will take you out of the muck and mire of your life and put you on a solid foundation. And when he puts you on that solid foundation, you will experience blessings that you do not deserve. You will experience life, the kind of life that you would always dream of having, not even knowing if you can ever dream of it, because why? When you follow Jesus and you go from glory to glory, you're experiencing him in the pow with the power of the Holy Spirit, he does things in our hearts and our lives to shift perspective. And in that shifting of perspective, as I come to him and I pour out my life and I empty it out, and I say, Lord, I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to be the husband that I'm supposed to be. I don't even know how to be the father that I'm supposed to be. I don't even know how to be the pastor I'm supposed to be. I don't even know how to be the friend I'm supposed to be. As I pour out my life before him, he fills me up with immeasurable grace and mercy through the power of his Holy Spirit to lead a victorious life and you wake up one day and you have a congregation full on Easter and by the way, you guys look beautiful and you have the ability to look at them and say, but for the grace of God, you don't have to live being stuck in a Saturday existence, but you can be truly free indeed. Free from the addiction, free from the pride, free from the religion, Free from, free from the, the, the troubled marriage that God will, will allow you to, to fall in love with your spouse again. He'll bring your wayward children home. He is the restorer of the prodigal sons and daughters. That we have these promises that we can live out and it truly is a joy to follow Jesus. I've asked Elise uh, Ferruja to come and sing this special song that God placed on my heart and I couldn't sing it so we wanted to have her sing it. And so Elise is going to come and sing this beautiful song about how it's a beautiful joy to follow Jesus. 
And I want you to listen to the words of these songs because there's something about this song today as we get ready to close and take our legacy offering that talks about the joy of following Jesus that takes you out of the muck and mire and puts you on a solid foundation so that you don't have to be stuck in the Saturday of your existence. You can walk victorious on a Sunday. Elise, thank you for singing with us today. to Christ I find true freedom count it all joy to take up my cross I'll follow these earthly wells have left me thirsty all worldly wisdom comes up empty only your word only your ways i'll follow what a joy it is to follow jesus what a darkness brings its questions when trusting you becomes a rest I have resolved no matter the cost I'll follow what a joy it is to follow Jesus what a What an honor to choose surrender and make him my everything. Yes, to surrender. Yes, to the altar. Yes, to your plans for me. Yes to correction, yes to confession, yes to refining me, oh, yes to your blessing, yes to anointing, your spirit alive in me, oh, yes to salvation. What a joy it is. If you're new to the presence of God, he just walked in the room. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And if you feel comfortable with it, would you stretch up your hands? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're here this morning. 
We thank you that you're here. We tell you what a joy it is to follow you, to say yes to you. Yes. We welcome. We welcome your correction, your conviction, your direction over our life. What a joy it is. Yes. I don't know about you, but Easter Sundays are always a reminder of what he's done, the authority that he walks in, the victory that I can have. And I don't know about you, but if I could do it all over again, I'd give my heart to Jesus again. And I want to give someone in this room an opportunity. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. You say, Pastor, I, I don't want to be stuck in Saturday living anymore. I want, to, I want to know what it means to walk in victorious. I'm tired of living in cycles. Tired of living in defeat and discouragement. I want to walk out of here knowing that I have the keys of the authority of the kingdom as a child of God. What a beautiful thing that is. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. You say, Pastor, it's me. I want to say yes to Jesus. Would you stretch up your hands so I can see them? Your hands are going up. I see your hands in the back. Yeah, Hands up. Yes. See them right here. What a beautiful thing it is this morning to say yes to Jesus. So what you're going to do is you're, there's about 15 or 20 hands that were raised this morning. Elisa's going to sing this song just one more time. And this song is just saying, Lord, I say yes to you. Yes to your wills. Yes to your ways. And there's a moment in the song where she begins to sing yes to. And you're just going to say yes, Lord, all of it. Elise, would you sing it one more time? Hallelujah. I give my life to follow Jesus. Hallelujah. Captive to Christ, I find true freedom. Count it all joy to take up my cross. I'll follow. These earthly wells have left me thirst. All worldly wisdom comes up empty. Only your word, only your ways. I'll follow. What a joy it is to follow Jesus. What a gift it is to bear his name. What an honor to choose, surrender, and make him my When the darkness brings its questions, when trusting you becomes a wrestle, I have resolved, no matter the cost, I'll follow. What a joy it is to follow Jesus. What What an honor to choose surrender and make him my everything. Yes, to surrender. Yes, to the altar. Yes, to your plans for me. Yes to correction, yes to confession, yes to refining me, oh, yes to your blessing, yes to anointing, your spirit alive in me, oh, yes to
my everything. What a joy it is to fall, Jesus. What a gift it is to bear his name. Hallelujah. Lord, we say yes to you. Father, um, 15 or 20 hands were raised saying yes to you. Father, I, I join them by lifting up my hands and saying, Lord, I say yes to you. Yes to your wills, yes to your ways. It's an honor to follow you. Father, every assignment of the enemy that's been over these dozen or so people's lives, we cancel it in Jesus' name by the mighty blood of Jesus. The cycles that they've been living in defeat, we rebuke those things in Jesus' name and we speak deliverance and life that's only found in Jesus. Father, we pray for peace, joy, love, and the Holy Ghost to abide in their life. We pray for sweet victory to come, knowing that it's not anything that we can do to attain, but it's that gift of your Son. Explained in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. So, Father, because you give, we receive. And, Father, would you make us conduits, not to, not to live just in the Saturday, but to live in the Sunday, victorious living. Father, we pray a prayer of blessing over each and every one of these people, we pray in Jesus' name.